I believe today is a day of destiny for someone here, maybe for several someones, for we have raised our praises to the great I am. And there's nothing that can stand against the plans of the King of Heaven and the Lord of Glory. And it's just uh, great to see you all. We have the CBD corner over here. <laughs> These guys I work with and uh, visitors and church family, just so valuable. <clears throat> It was a day of destiny for this young Jewish scholar. He didn't know it. In his mind, he had just come to witness the execution of one of the zealots of the way called the Jesus way. The man's name was Stephen. We we're told he was full of the Holy Spirit. And that he worked many signs and wonders. And he raised his voice to proclaim the good news of the gospel. And it so infuriated the Jewish believers there. That they dragged him out. And began to stone him. And as he is breathing his last. He drops to his knees. He says I commend my spirit into your hands. And then he says Father. Forgive them. And this young Jewish scholar was standing by with a crumpled pile of clothes at his feet. Just going, mm-hmm, right on. He got what he deserved. And that began the persecution of the church. It was as if they had taken a big stick and smashed it against the campfire that was ablaze with the Holy Spirit. And every spark that flew out lighted a new fire around the countryside. All the way down into Judea and Samaria. That was the spreading of the church. But that young man was determined he was going to go after every spark and stamp it out. He began to imprison women and men who were the followers of the way. He created such havoc in Jerusalem that he became uh, known as a holy terror. But in his heart, he thought he was doing the right thing. But he had had a, an appointment with destiny because that first Christian martyr looked out and said, forgive them. And I kind of think that those words rang in his heart even as he was trying to to bring up that, that zeal and that anger against the, the church. His name was Saul. He was born in Turkey in a city called Tarsus and moved to Jerusalem where he was raised and studied under the great Jewish scholar Gamaliel. He was, he was really high up. He was a Pharisee, strict in observance of all the law. He was the most religious man you could ever find. How many of you know religion isn't going to get you much of anywhere? And then on that day, he had gone to the chief priest and said, give me some additional authority. I'm not content with just Jerusalem. I want to go all the way to Damascus and round up some of those sparks. They're getting too dangerous. And so he's on his way. And as we heard in the reading of the scripture, out of the blue, seemingly, the light came, blinded him, and he heard the voice, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And his immediate response was, who are you, Lord? Implicit in that very question was that he had some recognition that the divine encounter had come his way. There's even an acknowledgement of the lordship. You know, he could have asked a different question, I guess. Like, why me, Lord? 
What did I do? Or what is going on? And so many times in our life situations, we want to ask the what question. Or the why question. Why did this happen? Why me? What's going on? But the real question to ask is the who question. Who are you, Lord? And that really is a relational question because our God is a relational God who came not to be a Lord over us, although he is, but to enter into relationship with us. And that first relationship to be established was a direct relationship with Jesus, the Lord. I hunger for more one-on-one -on -one encounters with my Lord. This is not some weird mysticism. This is the very spirit of God communicating with our spirit. There is a direct contact. We don't have to be just observing religious, religious rituals. We can come into a personal contact with God. And Paul, throughout his ministry, would make reference to the revelation that was given to him, the teaching that was given to him directly from God himself. And if you're someone who is searching, or maybe you're not even searching, I'm not sure Paul was searching, Saul at this point. He had another agenda. But the Lord came down and said, I'm going to change your agenda. You don't know what you're looking for, but I do, and I'm, I'm the Lord. Oh, poor Saul. He gets up. He's blinded. And suddenly this man who was so full of himself is humiliated, and his friends have to lead him all the way into Damascus. And there he stays at the house of a man named Judas who lived on Straight Street. For three days, he didn't eat or drink, and he couldn't see. Totally isolated. Paul never really spoke about those three days that we know of. I just wonder what might have gone on during that time as he communed spirit to spirit with his Lord. Maybe he remembered the teaching. Maybe the Spirit of God directly began to teach him because he knew the scriptures inside out. He knew all the prophecies. And then I think he worked in Saul's heart and said, that hatred, that animosity, I know it's a zeal for the Lord, but it's so misdirected. Let me turn it around for you. And then an amazing thing happens. He gives Paul a vision, and he gives another man a vision. His name is Ananias. They have coinciding visions. Paul has a vision that someone is coming to pray for him. Ananias receives the visitation and says, you need to go pray for someone. And, you know, God hasn't changed if we're open to it. He can still speak to us in dreams and visions and direct us maybe to go pray for someone. Ananias had a little bit of a problem. He said, oh, I'm willing to pray for almost anybody. I'm not sure I want to go to pray for this Saul. I know his reputation. He's dangerous. He's an enemy. Who would you not want to pray for? Maybe it's a political candidate. I don't know. Maybe it's a terrorist. Maybe it's someone who has a lifestyle that is repugnant to you. Maybe it's someone who has offended you. Someone you consider dangerous. But our call as Christians is to pray for our enemies. 
Not for their destruction, but for their salvation. Not only for their salvation, but the Lord might bless them. Say, oh, I don't want any blessings on that person. He doesn't deserve it. Yeah, well, you didn't either. And I didn't deserve it. We are all recipients of God's grace. But there was something that had to happen. As powerful as that one-on-one revelation was, it needed the confirmation, the impartation of someone praying for him. And as Ananias prayed for him, two amazing things happened. Maybe three or four. First of all, he was healed. This is a miraculous healing. Something like scales fell off his eyes and he could see again. And then Luke records that he was filled with the Holy Spirit. I don't know what that does to your theology, but the Holy Spirit's the Holy Spirit. (laughs) There had been a time of preparation and he was ready to receive the Holy Spirit. And then he was baptized. Bang, bang, bang. And he's a changed person. Now, I don't know when the exact point of time was when he was converted or when he was sanctified, but we know that at the end of those three days, he was filled with the Holy Spirit and he was baptized in the name of Jesus. But there was one more very important relationship, and it was a relationship with the community of faith. It says, Paul stayed there, Saul. We'll get to that name change in a bit. He stayed there and fellowshiped with the believers. And then he began to confound the Jews by proving that Jesus was the Messiah. So here he immediately goes from being the one who is destroying the people from the way to proclaiming it and proving from the scriptures. You see, God took that learning, that scholarship, that devotion, and turned it around. And now Saul is there beginning to build bridges within the community. And when he wanted to go to Jerusalem, they kind of had the same reaction Ananias did. said, I'm not sure we want to welcome this guy into our fellowship. He has wreaked havoc here in Jerusalem. My mother, my wife, my brother was imprisoned by him. I don't want to have anything to do. I don't think he's really converted. I think this is just a ploy. There was a real suspicion. We are called to be a community of faith that will embrace everyone. We may have our suspicions, but we are called to be an open, accepting community. A community that recognizes changed lives. That encounter on the road, that confirmation from Ananias, that integration into the community, all was part of answering that question, who are you, Lord? I am the one who is going to reveal to you. I am the one that is going to fill you with the Holy Spirit. I am the one that is going to bring you into community. It was a relational question with a relational answer. But it was also a very transformative experience. You really cannot come face to face with God and be the same. Just the vision of God will transform you if you get into his presence. Here are some of the things that happened to Saul. He moved from being the persecuted the persecutor to being the persecuted. Now he was one of the way, and he would find that there were other people out there who were willing to persecute him. But he had just totally changed sides. He moved from being the captor to being a captive, both spiritually and physically. One of Paul's favorite things to talk about was being a captive, a slave of Jesus. 
And that was his newfound identity. I am no longer a slave to fear. I'm no longer a slave to my hate. I'm no longer a slave to my vengeance. I am a slave to the love and the grace of Jesus because he met me on that road. And later he became a physical captive. He was put in chains. He was imprisoned and ultimately executed. But then I see a man who was very belligerent, changed, transformed to someone who is bold. What's the difference? Belligerence is all about me and my ideas and my strength. I'm going to go out and destroy the world. That's the belligerence. It all comes from the south. And Jesus transforms that, that belligerence into a holy boldness. He is just as bold. He, Jesus takes that personality. He doesn't annihilate it, but he transforms it. And he saw in that zealousness of the man Saul something that could be turned around and changed into a zealousness, a zeal, a boldness for the gospel. And Paul often prayed or asked people to pray that he would be bold in proclaiming the gospel. Even when he's in prison, he didn't pray for his safety. He didn't pray for his freedom. He said, make me bold in proclaiming the gospel here in my chains. Sometimes we think that if we come to God, he's going to wipe us out. He doesn't wipe us out. Well, yeah, he does kind of. But it's only that he can write something new. In our series on transformation and renewal, we talked about a renewed identity. And that's part of what it is. But then he was also transformed from someone who was empty to someone who was empowered. He didn't know he was empty because he was so full of himself and his own ideas and his own righteousness that he had earned by keeping every minute detail of the law as a Pharisee. And part of the problem is that we don't know how empty we are inside. But if God just lifts his finger that much and allows you to look inside, you'll see how empty and dark it is without God. And I think part of what was happening during that three days of not eating and drinking and being blinded was that he was being emptied of himself. And so when he regained his sight, he was filled, he was empowered with the Holy Spirit. And he went forth in that great power and anointing. What do you want to be filled with? There is a hunger in me to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And uh, this will sound a little strange, but you know, sometimes the Lord just brings a truth home to you. And I was this week sitting at my desk at work, CBD, you know, in between answering phones. It's kind of dangerous to pray and work at the same time, but you never know when the war is going to <laughs> You're crying and you're trying to answer the phone. <laughs> but I, we so often pray, oh, Lord, Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, come. All of a sudden I said, why are you praying for what you already have? I am within you. So my prayer now is, Holy Spirit, arise. Holy Spirit, arise. Take more of me. And there is a filling. Then the, I could go on in this, but I'll just highlight one more transformation. He was changed from someone who was ignorant to someone who was inspired. Again, he really didn't know that he was ignorant. In fact, he said, I was pretty smart. I am a scholar. I trained under the best teacher in all of Israel. I was his best student. <laughs> But he didn't know anything about God. But he became inspired 
so much so that his writings have become our Bible, the Holy Word of God. His letters speak of God who is really inspired. This encounter, though, that was so transformative was a very personal encounter. It didn't happen in the abstract. It was tailored exactly for the man Saul. There's something about a personal encounter with Jesus because it arises out of his passionate love. His love is persistent. His love is passionate. His love is personal. His love pursues us. You know, really, I think of all of the things that could have happened to Saul on the road. I mean, after all, what did he deserve? He deserved himself to be executed. Perhaps God could have had a band of bandits come up and attack them and kill him. I mean, you know, there are all sorts of things. Do you ever feel that God's mad at you? I think maybe God's mad at me. I mean, <sighs> look at the things I've done. Look at who I am. Look at what has happened to me. It must be because God is mad at me. Well, I don't think that God was happy with what Saul was doing, but he loved him. He loved the enemy that was persecuting his followers. And when he said, Saul, Saul, it wasn't with smoke and fire and vengeance in his voice. It was a passionate call to him. Saul, Saul. Why? It was a drawing of love. And here's something I want you to know passionately. That God will do everything he can to bring you to himself. And he knows exactly what you need to hear and what you need to see. He is not going to ignore you. He is not going to leave you alone. He is going to come to you again and again and again until you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you were loved. Even for those of us who may have been in the way, <laughs> following him for years, God is still pursuing you, wanting to reveal more of his love and more of his power. You have only begun to taste of the power of the Holy Spirit who lives within you. There are still areas of your life that aren't totally yielded to him. And those are the areas that God wants to touch. I'm going to take just a few moments here. To share a little bit of my own story. I wasn't sure I was going to do this. But I was sort of like a Saul. Born and raised in the church. My father, my grandfather, my great grandfather. They were all ministers. My great grandfather was one of the leaders who helped establish the church of the Nazarene. And became a general superintendent. For you old time Nazarenes, my great uncle was Halder Lewis. How's that? <laughs> he married my uh, grandfather's sister, Bertha May. I had a rich heritage. But you know what? That's not going to get you into the kingdom. But I remember the day at a junior boys' camp when my father slipped up beside me and said, Larry, do you want to give your heart to Jesus? I said, Yeah. How did you know? <laughs> Parents. 
It is your responsibility to lead your children to the Lord. Don't wait until they're 18. Try maybe four or five or six or eight. Ask the Lord when the right time is. It's not the pastor's or the youth pastor's responsibility. It's our responsibility as parents. And I remember those days when our young daughters were led to the Lord. Just simple, in their own understanding, and they grew in their understanding, but that's a serious responsibility. And then around age 17, I was called to preach. Remember that night so well. Went off to college, began my preparation, and then life happened. This thing crushed me. My heart was broken here. I was disappointed here. It was, it was the rolling 60s, and I was disillusioned with the entire church. And so when it came time to go to seminary, I said, I'm not sure I'm really ready, but I'm going to go. It didn't take me too long to find out that I wasn't ready. And uh, so I dropped out, wanted to do something significant with my life, joined the Peace Corps. <clears throat> Guess where they sent me? Korea. <laughs> uh, it wasn't what I was expecting, but it was uh, quite an experience. But we had 10 weeks of training in Hawaii on the big island. I mean, we had to do some suffering for it, right? <laughs> a beautiful place. But for the first time, I was completely cut off from all of my heritage and all of my upbringing. And all of the doubts and everything became coming to the surface. And I began to thinking, you know, I'm really, I'm really lost here. I'm not, I've lost my moorings. And I remember the first time one of my friends... By the way, my nickname was the Nazarene. They thought that was pretty funny. They reached across the table with a bottle of Primo. That's a Hawaiian beer. It said, here, have a drink. I did. I took a drink. And I go, he goes, now, do you feel like such a great sinner? I go, well, no, actually, I feel kind of good. I'm, I'm free of all of that. When you think you're free... You're not. And without going into detail, I found myself going further and further away from the Lord. One night, uh, maybe, uh, maybe a year, in, maybe six months into my experience, a friend of mine came to visit me. We'd been classmates back at Northwest Nazarene College. And we sat around one night discussing things, and all of a sudden she looks across the room and I said, hey, Larry, you don't believe all those things you used to believe, do you? I said, yeah. You're right. I don't. Goodbye. And there I made a decision to throw the entire Christian faith out the window and any relationship I'd ever had with God because I, I was pretty smart. I had a better answer to everything. <laughs> and things got worse and worse, and finally I was asked to leave the Peace Corps because of some of the things I'd done. Won't go into those details at all. It wasn't as bad as it sounds, but it's pretty bad. And I said, oh, fine. I don't need the Peace Corps. I'm going to come back to Korea I got myself a, a job teaching and doing some translation work and so forth. And I was feeling pretty good about myself. But I had to go home first. Where am I going to go? Well, I guess I'll go back to mom and dad. I didn't really want to, but I didn't have any place to go. I didn't know what to expect. For I had written them a letter. I said, dear mom and dad, I don't believe the things that I used to believe. Please take my name off the rolls of the church. I don't really consider myself a Christian anymore. And by the way, don't bother praying for me. <laughs> I 
You think they listened to any of that? <laughs> Parents, never, ever stop praying for your children. Never give up on them. Never stop loving them. God hears those prayers. God is in the process of answering those prayers probably even before you pray them. To my parents' credit, they did not reject me. They did not lecture me. My dad's a pretty good preacher. He didn't preach to me. They just loved me. Oh, I knew that they weren't happy with the way I was living and what I believed. They lived right across from the church. I didn't want to go to church, but I did. But some very strange things started happening. Oh, wow. Now, we live in a little town called Myrtle Point, Oregon. It's as small as it sounds, about 2,500 people. But it is the home of the Coos County Fair, which is about as small as it sounds, too. But I love county fairs there in southeastern Oregon. So I was there in August. It was fair time. So I go down to the fairgrounds, and I meet Dave. Now, Dave and I knew each other. We weren't close friends, and I knew he had relatives there. I hadn't seen Dave for, I don't know, four or five years, maybe. Hi, Dave. How you doing? Hi, Larry. How you doing? Hey, Larry. I've got something for you. I mean, this is about as far as we got in a conversation. I said, oh, Dave, really? Yeah, here it is. He reaches into his back pocket, pulls out a New Testament. I take it. I look at it. It's in Korean. I go, what does this mean? How I would this person that I haven't seen for four years suddenly, first thing after he meets me, give me a Korean New Testament. It must mean something. And then I had a very close friend, and every time I'd talk to my friend, they'd say, well, I've got to talk to Jesus about it. And I'd go, what? Those things that used to communicate with me just didn't communicate anymore. And then I did have to go to church, and wouldn't you know it, that was the weekend that we had a girls' trio from the Nazarene College. Now, I was raised with trios and quartets from the colleges. I sat in the back, and I go... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've heard this all before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can be very skeptical and cynical. And along about the third song, I go, well, huh, maybe they aren't faking this. Maybe, oh, maybe they've got something I haven't got. But I'm too far gone to ever find my way back, even if that's true. But I think it's true. The joy and the worship that was in there. Never underestimate the power of worship, guys. And then, this was the final straw, almost. Again, down on the fairgrounds. Across the big expanse of the, the hayfield parking lot, there comes a Jesus freak. The long hair and all of that stuff. And he just walks right towards me, hands me a paper and says, here, I think you need this. Walked off. I never saw him again. I don't know who it was. I read that paper. I opened up an article and just talked about the darkness of the heart without Jesus in it. And it was as if God just lifted his hand a little bit and I saw that inner darkness. And I stood there in an empty fair building, crying, weeping, not knowing what to do because I had burned my bridges behind me. But it was time to go back to Korea. And I was scared because I knew that the lifestyle I had adopted would eventually destroy me. I had to stop overnight in San Francisco. <coughs> I love San Francisco, romantic city. Checked into the big Bellevue Hotel downtown. 
And I said, I got a night out on the town. I'm going to enjoy it. Now, I'm a little strange. A night out on the town to me means a concert, a play, you know, something like that. So I walk out almost giddy with excitement. I'd gone two blocks, found a theater, said, oh, I'm going to see if it's play what's playing tonight. Do you have any tickets? Yes, it starts in about 15 minutes. We have a few tickets way up on the second balcony. Got my ticket, went up there, sat down, said, I wonder what's playing. Opened up the program and said, Godspell. <laughs> Godspell? What is that? A musical comedy based on the Gospel of St. Matthew. I said, this was not what I had in mind. <laughs> but being the drama person that I am, I took out my notebook to take notes. Seriously. The first character came on stage. This is the way the play opens up. And gives a parody of a philosopher. And then stands over in the corner just babbling to himself. Then the next one comes up, next one comes up, until there are about 10 philosophers. There's Plato, there's Aristotle, there's Augustine, there's all the way up to Jean-Paul Sartre. And all of them give their little parody and they stand over there and they're babbling to themselves. And suddenly it comes to me, oh, that's all philosophy ever gave me. So much babble and it means nothing. And then... From the back of the auditorium, I hear a sound I'd never heard before. I now know what it was. It was the blowing of a shofar. And when that shofar blew, suddenly there was like electricity went through me. I sat up. I go, what? I was almost asking the question, who are you, Lord? Because there was a light in that auditorium. And as that character comes from the back of the stage, he's singing the song, prepare ye the way of the Lord. And with each song and with each sound of the shofar, God was opening up to me something of a direct revelation. I, it was beyond words. It was like, we, in modern terms, we say it was a mega download. 600 gigs, you know, wah. And for one luminous moment, my destiny hung in the balance. But I was so aware that I had a decision to make. I could say, no. Or I could say yes, and I said yes. And then I said yes again, and yes again. And in that moment, my life was transformed. You see, we are each given a unique identity. Saul's was, I'm going to show you how much I, you're going to have to suffer for me. I'm going to make you into the Gentiles. What identity do you suffer under? Are you a victim? Become a victor. Maybe you feel your life is defined by failure. You can change that idea, that identity for one of victory as well. Maybe you just feel you're misunderstood. There's one who understands you. Maybe you're caught in addiction, and God can change that identity to one who worships. Maybe you feel you're unworthy, and we receive a new identity in Christ as one who is worthy. Or maybe you feel that you are, like Saul, master of your own destiny. God wants to change that identity into someone who serves the master. Maybe you are one who is successful. And that's your identity. And God will change that into be successful to me. Or maybe you just think you're cool. God says, I'll show you who's really cool. Because it's all about a personal decision to yield to him. And accept his identity. Paul was chosen from birth, he says. He talks about being chosen in his mother's womb. 
Now, we know that his name was changed from Saul to Paul. It wasn't one of those things like Simon to Peter. But he lost even his name. It's just the Greek form of Saul in order to bring the message to the non-Jewish world. And so the real question is the one that Jesus asked of his disciples. In Matthew 16, he turns to them and says, who do men say that I am? And they give all these answers. Then he turns and says, but who do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am? And that's the question before you today. Who do you say that Jesus is? And the answer to that isn't a theological one. It's not a religious one. The answer isn't, oh, well, he's the son of God and I believe all of that or I don't believe that. The question is even more personal than that. And the answer that he wants from us is, you are my Lord. Lord. 